What's going on everybody and welcome back. We're doing some work on the old Dodge today. Got some mounts I made up for the Holly with the 3D printer. Going to try to mount that little handheld unit on the dash so it stops falling off onto the floor. Got some core seal on the bed here so now this is all nice and black and it's you know free of rust. All the surface rust is gone. We're going to do the sides and whatever. So I'll throw up a little time lapse of that in a minute but uh, the distributor has been fixed as well. But my phone corrupted all the video files for, for that part, so I'll just have to show you what I did. This is the insert that I designed up for the uh, Holly to mount to, to replace the factory insert in the Dodge. So this is in my 3D printer software, the slicer. Well, if you've never seen how a 3D printer works, this is basically it. I've modified this one, but uh, it's all basically the same for this style. You got your filament that comes on down here. This is a stepper motor with like a gear on it, and that gear bites into this filament and drives it down into a heated nozzle at the bottom. That orange thing is the heat block, which heats it up, and there's a brass nozzle at the bottom with a little tiny, uh, just a little tiny hole in it. So this fan right here keeps the top part of the heat brake cool so that the, the nozzle doesn't just heat up all the filament and melt it, only the bottom part stays hot. That orange part down there is a custom fan. There's a fan behind it too that blows down and cools the filament as it's deposited down so that your, you know, your print cools off and they can build the layers up on each other. And then over here, you know, this is um, your temperatures, so 50, 50, 214, 215. The bottom numbers are the target temps, and these top ones are actual temps in Celsius. So 50 degrees Celsius is the bed temperature, and then 214, 215. That's the actual temperature of the nozzle itself uh, when it's extruding the filament. So to give you an idea, once you do the conversion, uh, 215 degrees is roughly 420 degrees Fahrenheit. So pretty hot. Um, but it's not really that hot in filament terms because some of the other filaments like nylon and polycarbonate and stuff require a lot more heat than that to melt them up. So this should work out pretty good. About another 20 minutes and we're done. I apologize for how dusty everything is. I pulled this one out of storage just to make these parts. Uh, I have a bigger printer that I use for most of my stuff. And this little girl here um, creates a lot of a lot of the cat hair and stuff that you see on everything but yeah this one was stored for about two years so here's my big dog printer that I built from scratch this is the one I use most of the time which is why the other one's covered in dust and cat hair um, this is a core XY printer or commonly just called a hypercube evolution that's the design of this uh, and this and this one here is a less modified version of the one that's printing over there. The main differences are that this one, on this style, like a Prusa or any of these, the bed moves back and forth on these guides there, these round ground rods. It'll move back and forth. This extruder head will move in this direction, and as the print grows and the layers stack up, this print head moves up. So the extruder will move up on lead screws behind the, you know, the frame there. On this one, the extruder head moves in the X and Y, you know, back and forth and in and out. And as the print grows, the bed drops. So this one is quite a bit bigger and nicer and can print a lot faster and bigger parts. So I don't really use these all that much, but that's the main differences in the printers. And there we go. We're done. And there we have it. Fresh part. Modified this one a little bit from the other one, so uh, hopefully it'll fit just a little bit better. These do shrink a little tiny bit as they cool off. Um, depending on the filament, it can shrink down. So I oversized it just a little bit for a better fit. Just gotta wait for it to cool and we'll go try it out. All right, well I made up three or two. This is the original one here. I, don't, I think I made four different versions and then settled on one of these. Now this one has the longer little tabs to lock it in, and this one has the shorter ones, because I don't know how well it'll fit. Anyways, let's see.
Well, that didn't snap in. So that means the tab, tabs aren't fitting on this one. Yeah. So these tabs don't stick out far enough on the edge there. So we'll try the other one. Now I did add a little boss in the back there so I can run some screws down in it. It's probably hard to see on the camera, but uh, I should grip on there. This one should fit. There we go. Oh yeah. She ain't coming out. Oh yeah, it's in there good. Cool. So there's the holly unit. So I'll just take off all this, you know, Velcro. It just it just won't stick. And uh yeah. We'll screw it right on down into there. Well, I drilled one little hole in it. Found a screw that'll work. Unfortunately, this thing has to be upside down, but I got to countersink it a little bit. There we go. That looks pretty good. The downside of doing it this way is that the holly unit has to slide in from the bottom, but overall I don't think that'll be a, an issue. It's It snugs up in there pretty good. There we go. Good enough. All right. Right on. Even if it does fall out, I'm going to be driving this in the summer, so it'll be on cool all the time. I'm not going to be driving it in the winter, so even if it does slide down, I can always put another, you know, thing behind or a little piece of Velcro at the top or something like that. That's as good as it's going to get for me. Not too bad, huh? I can barely hear in here. Well, this thing is responsive. Heck yeah. Came out pretty good. If I do say so myself. So there we go. Holly unit is in place. It's going to stop falling on the floor now. I'll find a place to route this thing at some point. Overall, this, the dash is in pretty good shape. I kind of hate to cut it all up. Some reassembly will be good. All right, so here's another distributor, um, the one that I took out of the truck. Now, what I did was I did the I did the spring swap on it. So if you look down in there, there's the light spring. It's got a lot of coils on it. And then we go around, and there's the super heavy duty factory spring. Um, when you buy the spring kits, you know you'll end up with the super light spring right here, ultra super small, and then you replace your mega stiff spring. Now Chrysler says that with their factory spring setup, this heavy one and the lighter one that's in here, you should be like at full advance at like 4,000 RPM. But when me and Jay checked this truck, it was like 52 or 5,300 RPM. I think might've been even higher that we were at, you know, full advance before we get full advance. We were like way up in the rev range. So um, yeah, I swapped the springs out and then I used an FBO uh, limiter plate dropped it in there to limit my timing to 18 degrees on the on the advance there so now we're at 36 degrees and with the one spring in end up kind of like 36 degrees at about 2200 rpm so that's good so as far as the idle air control on this thing goes i kind of did some hokey wiring on it to try to diagnose or track down what the problem is and i think i've got it solved not exactly sure, but it hasn't acted up since. So I ran some more grounds in here just temporarily, you know, big body ground and whatnot. Um, I did move all of the wiring away from all the high energy stuff like the coil and everything. Um, it's got as far away as I could and I put these ferrite cores on here. There's one right there. They just snap down and it eliminates noise in the line or it, it like kind of suppresses noise, electrical noise in the lines. 
So I don't know if that's necessarily what fixed it, um, but I did notice that once I put the cores on there before any of the grounds, it evened out my tack signal. So my tack signal was kind of erratic before. Now it's pretty much even. There aren't a ton of fluctuations in it. So I put this ground right from the throttle body right to a, a good, a known good ground on the body. Nice clean metal and everything. That's good. Put a big old battery ground right there to the chassis. So, you know, grounded from the battery to the body, body to the, you know, the holly, holly of the body. We got this nice big braid right here going to the chassis, chassis to the battery. So I'll leave this on temporarily and then, uh, you know, cut this, take it off. And then if the idle air control freaks out, we know that that ground needs to be added in. Uh, if I remove this, then I know that I've got a body ground issue and I'll have to add something else in. Maybe reroute this somewhere, put it, you know, right to the core support or whatever it is. But uh, we did disconnect this thing for a little while, me and Jay, and it didn't act up again. So I really don't know what to make of it. Who knows? So that's the brush I threw out. You can see even on the concrete, it just turns like a purpley and a black, you know, that kind of deal on it. So it, it changes color. It's not just the blue of the truck, but it, it just naturally turns kind of this purple. But this stuff works great. If you watched any of my other videos of this truck, um, you might have seen that there was kind of a dark square here. That's where I tried this Cora Seal like two years ago something like that on it and it held up great there were there were no more rust came through it no more surface rust nothing it sealed it in great when you apply this stuff properly it creates a sandable primer so you could just paint right over it after you scuff it down um, and up here you can, well you can kind of see across there it's got some some kind of big pitting in it up in this corner these dodges don't have drain holes so water would sit there and you can kind of see there were some holes the core seal ate right through that. So all of this stuff, you, you didn't even see this before, but the core seal did just eat all of the rust out of it. So I'm, you know, it looks worse now, but I mean, I'm glad that the rust is gone. So yeah, no big deal. I was even considering, you know, cutting that out, but really, yeah, this thing doesn't, doesn't need all that effort. I'm not sure what video this thing will make it into, but I figured since I'm doing the entire floor, might as well take a video of it so show you guys application of Cora seal it's pretty straightforward works great and that's it okay so I let the Cora seal dry overnight I did the tailgate too didn't do a super great job on it I just kind of you know wanted something on it brightened it up some you can see some of the brush marks in it not really worried about all of that but it kind of acts like a weird kind of clear coat but I probably need to pull this dog out and get her washed up you think old Puddin will be jealous about my pressure washer? 1.2 gallon per minute, baby. And the turbo mode. So yeah, we're, we're on a well here on the property. Um, and it's a low yield well on top of that. So we can't use like the really nice gas powered pressure washers or anything. It'll just like run our well dry within minutes and takes like two hours to recover the well. So anyway, that's about the way it goes. Anyway, I don't have enough tattoos or in good enough shape to do the pudding pressure washer montage. So hopefully uh, this will be good enough. <laughs> I guess the chorus seal doesn't like water. We'll see what it looks like after it uh, dries out a little bit. I mean, it makes sense. It's not really supposed to be a top coat. And there she is, all nice and clean. First time in a long time. I didn't really do that great of a job. 
But uh, if you watched the carpet installation video, a couple videos back or whatever, I did find the little ring that goes on there. So it was just kind of hiding in the bottom of the box. As far as 3D printing and car stuff goes, a lot of people complain or they say that um, the PLA, like basically the, the most inexpensive and easiest stuff to print, doesn't hold up in temperatures and heat and everything. So far it seems to be fine. I haven't ran into the problems that everybody else says that they have. There's stuff on the house that I printed three years ago on the outside little hangers and they're still perfectly fine after being in the sun and snow and everything for years. All this stuff needs to be painted, but paint's overrated. We're just gonna run it the way it is. Uh, I got the window somewhat clean, that's pretty nice. A Little bit of stuff to do still. This door is bent. So it's always been like that ever since I got it. Uh, it doesn't seal up great. It needs all new seals and all of the little corner glasses and stuff. It howls like crazy in here. It needs basically everything, but you know what? She works all right. I don't know about this video, everybody. It's been busy. I've got a lot of household stuff going on right now, but I'm sure you guys don't want to see plumbing and drywall and remodeling bathrooms and all that. I mean, this is supposed to be like a car focused channel. I don't know. I don't want all my views to drop off. Not that I get a ton or anything like that, but I figure keep all the house stuff away. Summer has been super busy. It always is for me. Hope you can understand. Give it a like, comment, subscribe, all that good stuff, and I'll catch you on the next one.